This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Ah, we're back. We're live. We're here on Global Connections. You remember that name. It's synonymous with Carlos Suarez, who has been a host on our shows for years and years. We're all getting to be old uh, since the time he started hosting. <laughs> and we have him now in his latest adventure, uh, which is in Mexico, where he is um, teaching in Mexico. And he is living in Mexico, although he's still associated with Hawaii Pacific University. Welcome back to your show, Carlos. <laughs> well, thank you, Jay. I'm really delighted, excited to reconnect and, and well, reconnect the global connections. Uh, as you said, I, I can remember years and years ago, before you had so many programs, uh, just the sparkle in your eye of this idea that one day we're going to produce so much content. And now, it, look at what you've done. You've created this amazing, uh, well, a set of uh, programs that goes on and on. And I'm excited to be able to connect you now. Uh, obviously, I have my heart there in Hawaii, but my body and my other part is here in Mexico uh, and look forward to sharing with you and our viewers some information. Uh, same here, Carlos. It's wonderful to see you and have you back. So tell us about your situation and, and we got a couple of uh, photographs that can help elucidate that. So where are you? What are you doing these days? Well, thank you so much, Jay. In a minute, uh, uh, I'm going to ask maybe we could look at the very first of the pictures. I have a map here of uh, Puebla, Mexico. And you may know, a couple years ago, I, I, really, I moved from Hawaii and basically settling in Mexico City area, where I still have kind of one of my legs and arms uh, and family, also in Texas and San Antonio. But now home is here in Puebla. Puebla, Mexico is a city about 60 miles east of Mexico City, very important historic city for Mexico. Uh, many of you will recall uh, our viewers Cinco de Mayo, which is not the uh, day of uh, Mexico's independence. It's a famous battle that was fought here in this city of Puebla by the French versus Mexico. Let's leave that aside for now, but maybe the next picture is the city of Cholula, which is a small, today it's really a suburb of, uh, of Puebla, and Cholula is the home of my university, uh, University of the Americas. An interesting story itself, it was founded in 1940 by a group of Americans from the U.S. And it's today a very dynamic uh, global university, a lot of connections itself to the world. Uh, and uh, the third picture, if we can turn to that. What is, what is that backdrop, mountain uh, behind the picture? It seems to be smoking, yeah, that mountain. That's right. This is a volcano, a famous volcano called Popocatépetl. And, and it is occasionally, it, it does spew some ash. Uh, it's not quite as active as Kilauea, but it is most certainly, and it's got a very uh, also important uh, historic symbolism for Mexico. Uh, Mexico City is on the other side of that uh, volcano. It's about probably 30 miles from here. Uh, and uh, so this is a picturesque view of the town of Cholula, where this university is. So if we're looking at the third picture, it's a picture, I think, of the university itself. And again, it brings people from all over the world. Many students from throughout Mexico, uh, different parts of Mexico are studying here. And today, about 30, 40 percent of the courses are offered in English, which is quite exciting. So I, you know, I, I, I'm fluent in Spanish. I certainly can do that. But they actually like my native English speaking skills because it helps them improve their language. Oh, how uh, interesting. So it's an exciting place. And what are you it's teaching? A campus. What are you teaching? Well, various courses in uh, international relations. So I do one on U.S. foreign policy, uh, never a dull moment these days. Uh, comparative politics, where we look at different political systems, and another course on European Union, uh, which is another area of my interest. So uh, a, a wide range, uh, but especially given my own professional development in the U.S., mostly Hawaii and California, I, I bring them a perspective informed from that and my many travels, as you know, all over. Yeah. So uh, what's it like I, living I like in Mexico? What's it like living in Mexico? Well, I mean, you know, you're, you're, you lived in Hawaii. Yeah. You enjoyed whatever Hawaii had to offer. How do you compare it, Mexico, the weather, you know, the food, the people, the whole enchilada, may I say? Absolutely. And, you know, like everything, every place you are on the planet, and I, I love traveling and seeing it, you always have different aspects, uh, the, the good and the bad. Mexico is truly a land of paradox. I mean, it's an old culture and society, but it's also new and dynamic and very globally connected today. More as a young child, I lived here several years as well. I finished my high school here. But today it's a different world. Uh, NAFTA, we'll say a few words about that later, really has connected the U.S. to the to North America, to, to, I'm sorry, Mexico. Uh, and, you know, it is also a place where the culture is so vibrant and dynamic and colorful. Uh, the cuisine, and even the city of Puebla here is known for its gastronomy. Uh, on the other hand, again, uh, and we'll say a few words about India in a while, this paradox also means you have 
you know, some very difficult challenges. Mexico does have some, you know, socioeconomic challenges, uh, violence, insecurity, uh, real challenges. Now, I want to make clear, you know, most people's lives are very much, you know, comfortable and, and even happy in the midst of all these issues. Uh, it's a good quality of life overall. Uh, and, you know, you just have to adjust and make those uh, adjustments. Uh, I am bilingual, bicultural. I've always been connected to Mexico, so it's quite easy for me. But I'll tell you, there are over a million Americans living here in Mexico. So it's been a place that has always attracted many retirees, many other young Americans who see the opportunity here to, to be a connection to this part of the world. Yeah. Well, I want to cover two other things with you. Um, so let's, let's, uh, let's, uh, let me identify what I have in mind. One is I want to catch up in uh, your experiences in India. Last time you and I spoke, you were in Goa, was yes. it? Uh, and, That's right, in Goa. And that was really very interesting. And I want to catch up from that point. I know you have yeah. some photos to show us. And after that, uh, I, I would like to um, talk about foreign policy and international relations, what you yeah. teach. I want to be a of student, course. okay? And I want to know your thoughts and the thoughts of your students <laughs> about how things are going in this country mm -hmm. and in the world mm -hmm. on international relations, which, which used to be, I think, a kinder, gentler kind of experience than it is these days. <laughs> yes, uh, we are in a different time and chaos and uncertainty, of course, particularly with Mexico and the U.S., a very tense moment. So let's come back to that. Maybe we can turn to one last slide I have up here of Mexico. It's a little picture of folkloric uh, Puebla City, this place I am. And uh, it's a very good mixture of the old, uh, very colorful, but also very modern and new. I mean, you don't see it perhaps in that picture of this folkloric part, but that's what's exciting about this place. You can have this very modern, dynamic, you know, uh, 21st century, and then you turn the corner and you're in the 18th century, and, and they side by side. It's quite exciting. Uh, but let me say a few words now and turn our attention to India. Uh, last fall semester, I was able to spend a little over five months there, and it was on a Fulbright grant as a visiting Fulbright professor based in Goa. Goa is an interesting place in the West uh, Arabian Sea coast. Uh, but it allowed me as a good base to travel and extensively give some lectures. Uh, India is a paradox as well. Uh, I mean, it's an exciting emerging you know, economy, emerging, emerging dynamic system. Uh, it's a land of tremendous, tremendous, uh, uh, you know, natural, historical, uh, you know, beauty, religious diversity, et cetera. It's not for everybody in terms of a place to go and visit. It, I mean, it, it is a shock to the system, uh, the, the extreme poverty, the chaos and inefficiency, uh, you know, just every day you get inside a taxi or a little rickshaw and your life is being negotiated right there. <laughs> uh, and, and, and yet it is such a paradox. I, I've got a few pictures. We'll turn maybe to number five, which is, a, you know, the classic picture of an ox cart here, you know, uh, be, uh, you know, being pulled by some oxen. And you'll see this just about anywhere throughout the, particularly the rural areas. Uh, we turn to the next picture, number six, and we have a typical picture of a street market. Again, you know, a very colorful uh, um, you know, uh, very, you know, poor people, but people who have a lot of dignity and pride. And I think what fascinated me is that even the most humble and poor people, they have beautiful, you know, clothing, colorful, they, they wear it with pride. Uh, and a lot of times clothing in many cultures, traditional cultures, tells you a lot about who they are, where they're from, what their religion is. Uh, but very fascinating to see, you know, the people, uh, you know, with just very simple life, but very colorful uh, and you can contrast that. We have this other part of India, like Mexico, a land of contrast and paradox. Uh, the number seven picture is a, an example of a very wealthy Indian woman. And, you know, here's a country that within a few years we're told is going to be uh, passing China in population. It's got about 1.2 billion, but it's growing faster than China. And you have a pretty sizable population that is very wealthy, very well-connected, well-educated, basically globetrotting, you know, back and forth to different parts of the world. And the elite, the wealthy, I mean, they have had, you know, for millennia, obviously many, many years of, uh, I guess, uh, you know, a rich heritage as well. Do you think, uh, we'll, have a, now, you think we'll have a movie coming soon called uh, Crazy Rich Indians? <laughs> well, many of them already exist, and we, we know the story of Bollywood. They produce more films than Hollywood, and frankly, there are already many of those there. Some of them have made it into the U.S. market. Uh, even Hawaii, many years celebrating the annual Bollywood Film Festival. Uh, it's remarkable how India has this tremendous sort of, you know, soft power, this cultural appeal that is uh, remarkable. And, and again, I, I go back to what I said earlier, that it's not for everybody. It's a difficult place to get around. It's not easy. Uh, and it's a shock to the system. You know, the smells, the, the horns beeping, the, you know, the danger and insecurity. 
And yet, obviously, you know, if you can adjust and adapt, it's also exciting. You'll turn the corner and see the most beautiful temple that is just sitting there, uh, or the people can be very friendly, very warm. Uh, but it is, uh, it was hard. It was not as easy as going to, let's say, Austria or, you know, even Mexico, frankly. Coming back to Mexico, it was like, ah, oh, almost the first world here. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I had a great experience. I really got to, uh, you know, in that short time. And very much what the Fulbright program, which is a government, uh, U.S. government and India government program of exchange, it allowed me to really both be connected to many people there. It opened doors. And if I turn to the next slide, there's a picture I have, number eight. Uh, a picture at Banaras Hindu University. Banaras is also known as Varanasi, a famous city on the Ganges River, very the spiritual center of Hinduism. And this university, I'm there meeting with a man who himself, he was a Fulbright scholar to Connecticut. And so Fulbright, again, this exchange program that's been around many decades, it, it helps to connect you with others who have had opportunities, in this case, to study and work in the U.S., uh, and that opens up doors. I visit this guy, he shows me around, uh, I get a deeper understanding that uh, more people-to-people -people exchange. And, and so uh, this, uh, this gentleman that's there is a professor at this university. Uh, other than that, uh, I, I want to say... Uh, well, you know, you know uh, Carlos, we, we have a correspondent. Yes. We have a correspondent in Varanasi. His name is uh, oh, Kardiki Mishra, and he lives in, he's a uh -huh. college okay. student. I'm not sure, it might even be that, ah. that school... And he reports to us every yeah, month yeah. or so and tells us how okay. things are doing on the Ganges. And he's mm -hmm. very Akamai. Yeah, yeah. He's very Akamai. He understands. He's a business student. He understands global business. And it's really interesting yeah. that you were, you were near him if you were uh, yes. near the Ganges I, and all I, that. I wish I had known. Uh, and, and this university, this is their premier university at that place, the BNU it's called. It's a very important university. Uh, and, you know, the Indian higher education system, I was there in many ways studying about that too and how it is that they are preparing their future leaders, like this young person you talked about. And it is quite remarkable. They really are developing uh, a human capital, a capacity for people who can walk. And, and India, of course, big population, has a very large pe population of people who have good English language skills. Uh, that's why we have call centers set up there, mm -hmm. uh, but also their ability to manage multiple languages. The average, even a taxi driver will typically speak three, four, five languages like nothing, and they learn them on their own. They're not even taking classes. They just figure out how to get by. That's a remarkable mm -hmm. skill that, yeah. uh, again, uh, help, helps them function. Um, I want to share with you maybe two more pictures from this India. In the number nine picture, I was then traveling in the south of India, Kerala, a beautiful state in the southern, uh, southwestern portion. And here is a place that for many decades has had a very powerful, strong communist party, uh, and yet as a result has had very progressive and very uh, uh, successful sort of, you know, health care initiatives and you know, poverty alleviation. Compared to other parts of India, this place, you don't see the stark poverty. It's a much more developed. And what I found fascinating, here is a picture of a campaign ad for the Communist Party, and it has pictures of Lenin and Stalin, I mean, which are, you know, beyond heard of anywhere else in the world in today, in 2018, 2017, during the last election. So the Communist Party, still connected to the, you know, forefathers founding it from Russia, they took pictures of Lenin and Stalin on their campaign ad. Wow. Uh, I just found that to be quite interesting. Wow. Uh, the final one I have, it underscores, again, India's connection to the world. There's an interesting billboard that I found, which gives you a, a, an advertisement to study, to work, and to migrate. Uh, essentially, you know, wherever you want to go, Germany, you know, UK, Canada, the U.S., uh, there are places there ready to help connect you there, uh, find work opportunities, study opportunities. And there's a growing number of Indians today, this new emerging middle class, that are very mobile. And they have the education, the skills. They find opportunities to go out, but also, very important, to return. And some years ago, uh, you know, one of your, uh, I think David Heenan had published his book on the sort of return capital flight. You see it today, a lot of entrepreneurs and leaders who, they lived in the U.K. or in the U.S. for 10, 20, 30 years. Now they're back in India with, you know, the home cooking and the, you know, the local life, and yet still very connected to this outside world. It's a fascinating uh, story of, of this sort of ability to move back and, and stay connected. So you're Fulbright yeah. there in India. What did you work on? Well, I did a combination of some teaching. I taught a course there at an engineering and science school in Goa, and that was fascinating. These students of you know, technology, but they're interested in social and political issues. They have a passion for it. Uh, so I taught uh, one course, 
but I also then did a project looking at studying the higher education system and how it is that they are training leaders. So visiting a lot of universities, learning about what they are doing to promote global learning, giving some lectures at some of these other universities in the South and in Maranasi, uh, in, um, in different places, and mainly that, focused on what is the higher education system doing there to prepare future leaders. And it's pretty clear there's a, you know, a national policy, but then India is a federal system, so at the very you know, state level, there are a lot of places doing you know, their own initiatives. Uh, and that, that was the gist of it, a mixture of teaching and research. So the research allowed me to travel quite a bit to visit many parts of India. Yeah, and that was a good ramp up for coming back to Mexico and being a mm -hmm, professor mm -hmm. of international relations. Uh, so yeah. we're going to take a short break, Carlos. We'll come back and I, I want to hear your thoughts about international relations these days. Yeah. Teach me, Professor. <laughs> we'll be right back. <laughs> this is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. メッセージフロムザファンデーションフォーアベターライフ。皆さんこんにちは。ティンクテックハワイが日本語でお届けする。こんにちはハワイの日本語放送のホスト国末ゆかりです。各週月曜日の2時からお届けしています。日本語コミ
it, it has changed the way we do everything. Even I teach a course on diplomacy. Diplomacy is now impacted in ways so that if you're a government official, or a diplomat negotiating, you have got to use social media in ways that, guess what, they didn't prepare you for that in your you know, study <laughs> yeah. to be a diplomat, but suddenly you need to know, you know, the importance of that. And that allows you uh, a bridge to civil society directly. So instead of just people to people, oh, no, no, I'm sorry, instead of government to government, diplomacy is now happening in different ways, you know, going directly to society. Uh, and, you know, some of my former students from HBU who are young diplomats now uh, are involved in this, and they're having to do that. Uh, both explaining and, and maybe building support for foreign policy through social media. Very different world. Yeah. Um, beyond that, I think uh, it is, again, this global education that anywhere I go now, my classroom here or in Austria or in India, maybe a little bit less India, uh, but in general we have so much mobility of students now, or like at HPU in Hawaii. People come from everywhere. Look how many Swedish and Norwegian students we have there. Here I have students in my class from France and Italy and from uh, Ecuador, from Switzerland, from Canada. And that dynamic changes everything. When, once you have several you know, international students, they both contribute to the dialogue and they bring a different energy, mm -hmm. a different perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I'm teaching about political systems and I have a Swiss student and they have a fascinating you know, confederation, a very you know, plural executive. They don't have a single leader. And then I can not just explain that, but ask him, well, how is this, you know, how does this reflect it in your day-to-day -day life? I mean, what's different living in Lausanne versus Zurich or whatever it might be? So it's this both practicality and a real-world perspective. And back to the idea that the students today, particularly at a more elite university, this is not the case maybe at a, you know, uh, different type, but at a school where the students have had opportunities to travel growing up, uh, they have seen the world. And now there's reflecting on it in a different way like ah that explains why you know they do this differently there so we bring i think i always like to think of the classroom it has to be a dynamic environment not just me top down telling them but instead i like to learn what do they know what do they bring to the table and those experiences they can help connect them more and, and personalize it more and i think i like to tell the students they often learn more from their own peers than just from you know mr professor here yeah. it's really more helping them teach each other, and raise questions to have curiosity about the world. I'm, I'm remembering your time in uh, Austria. You spent a lot of time, mm -hmm. another, another Fulbright, as I recall, yeah? Yes, uh, you, you were a over three years ago. HPU's mm -hmm. man in Austria, it was really amazing. We, <laughs> we talked to you a number of times when you were in Austria. But all, yes. the, all this yes. suggests, all this uh, you know, change in international relations and the art, if you will, of diplomacy, um, you know, it all suggests that the students that you have, or who would be going to school in some other school, another country, could be anywhere, uh, would like to be involved in diplomacy, would like to be involved in making international relations, uh, would like to be involved in connecting countries with the kind of, you know, connection, the kind of guanxi that makes a better world, a safer world, mm -hmm. and all that. So when they come to you in Mexico, in Pueblo, uh, do you, Puebla, excuse me, uh, they, mm. they, are they seeking positions in, in uh, the, the di diplomatic service? Uh, are they seeking work in, in Mexico or the U.S. or some other uh, you know, State Department organization by which they can practice diplomacy? Well, yes, all of the above. Now, the reality is that the diplomatic service, whether here in Mexico or in the U.S., it's a small elite. There are very few diplomats every year. And these days in the U.S., with the drastic cuts to the State Department, even less. But what I like to make very clear to the students is you can do diplomacy, you can do international relations, and not have to be a formal official diplomat. More, more likely, they're going to have opportunities in NGOs or in international organizations. Ah. Uh, they can, if, they're, if they're very entrepreneurial, they may even establish their own you know, organization that obviously deals with government, deals with civil society. And I think it's fair to say that while diplomacy, the traditional view is just you know, government to government, we really have, I mean, whether it's an issue like human rights or environmental issues, there are so many players now, international organizations, there could be a small NGO that's very localized, and they are still able to engage. And, and again, using the technologies, understanding how policy gets made. So these students, very few of them, whether here or in the U.S., are going to become diplomats. But mm. some of them do, and we have, of course, a handful. The reality is that most of them will move on to different private organizations, different non-governmental type uh, 
some of them even in the private sector, perhaps with companies that are doing business and you need somebody who understands obviously how culture, society, politics work. Uh, you need finance people, you need accountants, but you also need people who really understand negotiating across cultures. And that's uh, fundamentally, those are the kind of skills that I think a student of international relations is learning. But again, like everything, they have to be able to be resourceful in more areas. So it's not just knowing a few facts, it's people to people knowledge, it's learning how to be creative, problem solvers. Uh, and so, yes, the students here, for example, many of them have opportunities to, during their studies, to spend a semester or a year abroad and then even to work. Some of them will have opportunities to find work outside of Mexico or in other parts. And given Mexico, Mexico City is the center, the hub of particularly government and, and finance and all. Uh, but even provincial cities like Puebla, this is a city of maybe about two or three million. So it has its own connection to the world. It has a large community of European immigrants, Germans. There's a huge factory here of Volkswagen and Audi. And, you know, many of the managers are brought here from Germany directly. So they actually sometimes even will hire managers that they will send back to Germany to train and, and you know, help them then come back and be more effective uh, leaders here. So it is a little bit of everything, and uh, it's both exciting, but it's also daunting because the challenges are very big. Yeah. You need language skills. You need you need adaptability skills. Uh, you need to know a lot about a lot of different things, sort of a general knowledge. You have to have a world view, and you have to be able to get out there and travel and mm -hmm. appreciate yes. your relations. And so it's like going to law yes. school prepares you to practice, but it also uh, prepares you to, to, to be in the business community and uh, make deals mm -hmm. uh, in any capacity. Yes. It's the same yeah. thing here. Um, but you know what, what we've, yeah. been, we've been seeing for the past 18 months, the U.S. State Department uh, degraded uh, from Tillerson Till mm -hmm. on. Uh, and right now they say that, you, you know, there's nobody there anymore. There haven't been uh, hirings to replace, uh, you know, the attrition. Um, and the State Department mm -hmm. is at, at very low levels, both in numbers and mm -hmm. in morale. Um, and it's really a of sad course. story for the United States. And, uh, and I wonder, you know, what your mm -hmm. thinking is about that, and I wonder what your thought is about how ideally a State Department should work, how ideally diplomatic relations should work, and whether, yes. uh, this is a compound question, and whether there's room in today's, you know, flat world, multinational world for isolationism and, and tariff barriers. Yeah. Is there room for that? Are we, yeah. How, how yeah. badly are we off course is what I'm asking. Yeah. Well, this is a tough time. And uh, case in point, Mexico, there is no U.S. ambassador here. 18 months of this administration is not even a designated. There's no candidate. Uh, basically, uh, a country as important as Mexico, one of the leading trade partners for the U.S., and there is not an official here who represents the president. Uh, now, we have a different president in the U.S., uh, different in the sense of, you know, he doesn't maybe use uh, the diplomacy in the same way, doesn't respect the you know elites and the professionals. Uh, at the end of the day, yeah, there's you know there's a lot of concern right now that the U.S. is definitely veering off its tradition. Now you mentioned isolationism, and the U.S. has a long history. The whole history of the country is one of a struggle between isolationism and internationalism. These are recurring themes. You know, at the end of World War One, in the 20s and 30s, the U.S. kind of closes the door and, and stays home. Uh, after Vietnam, there's not a lot of desire to engage in conflicts, and yet we find ourselves spread all out. So there's always a powerful force for that. But sadly, when it comes to these complex issues of diplomacy and trade and all that, I mean, they require experts. They require people to negotiate. And as we speak now, there is an ongoing negotiation between Mexico, the U.S., and Canada that was brought back today to the table. But, um, you know, even the teams that are leading the current U.S. administration, you know, they're, they're often being very unrealistic in their demands. They're being very, you know, bullying, a, a style of negotiation that might work in Queens or, or you know, in, in you know, a reality TV show. But unfortunately, it has eroded a lot of the credibility and prestige of the U.S. And, to, you know, increasingly the Europeans are now saying, look, we, we, we can't depend on the U.S. We can't even trust what they're saying. And we've got a president currently under so much pressure and tension. And, and you know, uh, we, if we try to think about, you know, understanding the Trump, if there's such a thing as a Trump, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, approach or philosophy or guiding principles, it's hard to find. It's chaos, it's uncertainty, unpredictability, and that is not the way you either do business or that you can negotiate across borders, you know, solutions to problems. Mm. So it's a tough time, and, and, and Mexico, a very important partner, 
today is, is also going through a political transition. They're about to inaugurate a new president in December. And so you have a lame duck outgoing president who's negotiating this deal. The new administration will come in. Are they going to want to have to, you know, fine tune it themselves? Uh, it's a tough time. And, and like you said, uh, particularly for the U.S., the diplomatic corps, the diplomatic services, that's the lowest point of morale that we've seen in decades. And how, how much damage is going to be done before it can be turned around? We will have to wait and see, but but right now we're definitely at the bottom of a pretty tough, uh, uh, hopefully the bottom, but it's certainly at a low point in U.S. foreign policy, uh, you know, credibility, uh, image. Uh, it, it's a tough time. Well, Carlos, there's one last question I can't resist a asking you, and and that yeah. is, um, you know, when you have a bad administration like this, bad in terms of so many things, but bad in terms of um, you know uh, foreign policy. Um, and that administration ends for one reason or another, maybe, you know, by somebody else being elected, whatever. And now you have somebody else mm -hmm. who is more pro progressive and international uh, in, in, in his approach uh, that follows. Um, how hard is it to put Humpty back together again? If I destroy and undermine, um, you know, longstanding uh, diplomatic relationships around the world, including my yeah. own long-standing allies, how hard is it to put those relationships right, to mend those no. fences later? Yeah, it is hard. It's not easy. And so there is obviously a sense that, you know, the damage is not going to change even in, whenever the administration does. And I even tell my students, look, there will be a day, believe it or not, when Donald Trump will not be the president of the U.S. Maybe it's in six months, maybe it's in two and a half years. Maybe it's in six and a half years. I don't know. I mean, uh, looking pretty grim for him today, but there will be a post-Trump world. And, you know, the U.S. today is facing a lot of criticism that it has sort of abdicated its leadership role. Uh, obviously, it will take time to turn around. It won't be overnight. But I also think this, that there is a growing awareness, of, at least among many who do understand the U.S., that Trump is an anomaly. He's not the norm. And while he may you know, reflect some of the frustration and maybe, you know, anxiety in certain sectors of American society. There's also, you know, there's a long, uh, a good part of American, you know, government and business that understand that the U.S. has got to be engaged in the world and has to be a global, you know, positive contributor. So my hope is that over time, much like we say the institutions, you know, I think you had a, a, a discussion earlier about, you know, how you become an authoritarian or, or you know, uh, you know, I, I have long taught in courses about transitions from authoritarian rule to democracy. That's been the trend. Today in the U.S. and in parts of Europe, we have an opposite. We have democracy becoming authoritarian rule. And let's just hope that the institutions of the U.S., I believe and hope, hope that they are strong enough to withstand that and to sort of bounce back. But it won't be soon. It'll be, you know, the damage will be done. Uh, the credibility will be hard yet to earn back. Uh, I think it will happen. And I think that at least uh, among experts and elites, there's an awareness that there's, uh, you know, enough, I don't know, enough uh, desire to want to see the U.S. back on a more positive footing. Uh, obviously in a different world, because the U.S. will no longer be, you know, calling the shots the way it did after World War II, yeah. or, yeah. you know, uh, it's a different reality today. But, you know, the U.S. has been a source of inspiration for many other places and, you know, in, in, in providing leadership for the international system. Today, that has eroded. Uh, will it come back? Gradually, yes, but in the same way, no. It'll be a different reality. I think we're going to have to be more humble and, and more, uh, uh, well, uh, I say we, I'm saying you maybe because I'm now here in Mexico. <laughs> but the U.S., I think, in the future leadership is going to have to be very, uh, work hard to, to try to regain the, the trust. And, and, and But again, I think that out in the international community, whether here in Mexico and Europe, pe people are aware that, uh, you know, the U.S., is always going to be a, a global player, uh, and that this Trump uh, experiment uh, is a very uh, strange aberration, an anomaly. Uh, and someday we will be in a post-Trump world. Let's just hope it's not totally broken. Maybe we can put it back together uh, without taking too long. <laughs> from your lips yeah. to God's ears, how do you say that in Spanish, Carlos? From your what, lips, what to, from again? your lips to God's ears. Well, de tu boca a las, a las orejas del Dios, something like that. So <laughs> Dios is the God, and the oreja would be the ears, uh, and from your lips, de tus labios, de tus labios a las orejas del Dios.
And in Something response, like that. Let, let's hope. In response to that, I say, hasta luego. We got to go. Hasta luego, yes. Yeah. And so two weeks from go. now, you'll be back. I, I can hardly wait to see mm -hmm. your, you know, your whole international discussion flower internationally. It'd be great. Yeah. Thank you so much, Carlos. Very much. Thank you, Jay. Great to see you, and aloha to all our listeners. Thank you so much. Take aloha. Care. <laughs>